Hello everyone, welcome to 1.5 Degrees, the podcast where together we explore the science solutions and stories involved in the fight against climate change. I'm your host, Heidi Pan, speaking with the professionals behind the latest research, policies, culture, and innovations shaping our response to global environmental challenges. For today's episode, we are joined by Hannah Safford, who is the Senior Policy Advisor for Transportation and Resilience at the White House Climate Policy Office to discuss bridging the gap between science and technology and policy implementation. Hannah has deep experience working on both sides of the science policy nexus, including as Associate Director of Science Policy at the Federation of American Scientists, a policy advisor for the 2020 Biden-Harris presidential campaign, a fellow at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, a researcher with the UC Davis Policy Institute for Energy, Environment, and the Economy, and as a chair of the City of Davis Natural Resources Commission. Hannah's work and commentary has been previously featured on MSNBC and Al Jazeera, as well as in Nature, PNAS, and others. She holds a PhD in environmental engineering from the University of California, Davis, as well as an MBA in public and international affairs, an M engineering, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce the degree, (laughs) an M E N G in environmental engineering and water resources and a BSc in chemical and biological engineering, all from Princeton University. Thank you so much for joining us today, Hannah. It's truly, truly an honor. Really happy to be here. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess to, to start for your listeners, can you briefly introduce what your role as Senior Policy Advisor for Transportation and Resilience at the White House Climate Policy Office involves? The um, Biden administration is the first administration in U.S. history that has had a dedicated climate office at the White House. Uh, and so our job at the White House Climate Policy Office is to coordinate implementation of the Biden-Harris Uh, administration climate agenda across the White House and across federal agencies. So my role uh, within the climate office focuses on coordinating and implementing the transportation and climate resilience related aspects of that overall climate agenda. Cool. And if we could talk about how you came to do what you do today, we could go back to the beginning, so to speak. You previously mentioned speaking with someone who had never seen a snake before while you were um, uh, a teenager at the San Francisco Zoo. Um, Like that was a notable memory for you. Could you tell us more about just some experiences that you've had growing up that inspired you to work in the environmental space in the first place? Um, Maybe even how you came to work in policy and just also how those experiences might have continued to inform what you do today professionally. Yeah, when I was a kid, so I grew up in San Francisco and was always um, pretty interested in in animals and the outdoors. And when I was 12, started volunteering at the San Francisco Zoo and I volunteered at the zoo for uh, nearly 10 years um, and, you know, always just really liked that part of me getting to work with animals and getting to connect people with animals. And I think as I got a little older and went into college and started thinking about what I was going to do in college and afterwards, um, left to my own devices, I think I would have majored in something like environmental science, but my my dad was an engineer and sort of said, you you can always engineering into environmental science, but it's a little harder to go the other way. Um, And then I ended up about my mom's advice, doing a a minor in public policy. And I think through both of those things, through the engineering and through the policy, started thinking about my, I really loved working with animals, but there's sort of only so much. If you work at a zoo, you're not really doing a lot to um, advance the existence of animals in the wild for the long term or natural spaces for the long term. And so I was kind of like, there's the stuff that I enjoy doing that's kind of fun. And then there's the good that I want to change in the world and and make in the world so that other people can have those experiences. And that was what got me thinking about doing kind of more of an applied, broader environmental career. I had the opportunity to do a couple of internships in government and then did a two-year fellowship in government after I finished uh, finished my undergraduate degree. And it just made me realize how for these um, areas that have a lot of externalities, like mm-hmm. the environment and climate change, um, you know, you, this is the, really where government exists is to help point society in the right direction where maybe like private market forces mm-hmm. wouldn't do that. Um, and so it just, it, it made sense to me of working in government. This is the way to 
make change that otherwise isn't going to be made. Um, and and then I just really loved working with people in government. I think that like the the types, a lot of times DC and government gets painted as kind of power hungry, ambitious mm-hmm. politicians. Um, but the people who are on kind of the uh, politics side and the policy side of the aisle are different. And um, a lot of the people who are working kind of more behind the scenes on policy and government are people who truly want to make a difference in the world and believe in the power of government and public service to make the world a better place, whether that's in public health or education, or in my case, climate and the environment. So I just, I found um, that there were a lot of more more smart and dedicated people in government than I had expected. Mm -hmm. Um, And so kind of set me on my path towards staying in the area. Super cool. Um, And yeah, I mean, also just like going back a little bit, but like working at the zoo at 12 that's so cool <laughs> to be able to yeah do that. The, i don't um, think i don't think that many zoos offer an opportunity for yeah. like 12 year olds handle animals but the san francisco zoo t- t- took a chance and mostly <laughs> works out pretty good mm. yeah no we we need a lot more taking chance on young people i feel like there's this a lot we, uh, we can all do uh, yeah i think as you get older you forget how sophisticated you were as a young <laughs> yeah. As a younger person. And so by the time you're in a position to like say, oh, could a 12 year old, you know, manage an animal in front of the public for hours at a day? You're like, no, like 12 year olds can't really do anything. But like when you're 12, you're like, I can do a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Forget about it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's kind of like while we're on the conversation of just like working, you know, as as a younger generation, I mean, you you talked about being a fellow at the White House of Science and Technology Policy under President Barack Obama when you were just like 22, uh, mm-hmm. which is, you know, relatively young. And I guess like, I guess I, I was curious about, you know, because, you know, tackling climate is a, in a way that's, you know, involving all generations is really crucial, I guess, like, you know, we're gonna need to have more people of all ages working in climate. So I guess, <laughs> What was some of your maybe experiences like working as a younger person in this space? And I guess, do you have any advice for working in an intergenerational environment and navigating potential challenges that come with that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, my advice for younger people who are, um, you know, working in impactful environments early on is to believe that you deserve to be Mm -hmm. there. When I started um, at the White House at 22. Um, I had the opportunity through this fellowship program, but kind of thought that my role was to be there to listen and learn, and um, which partly that was true, but it's not school. My my role was also then to actively contribute, and about three months into that um, job opportunity, my boss called, I thought I was doing a good job doing what I was supposed to be doing. And then my boss called me in and said, you know, if you don't step up and take initiative and contribute to the actual day-to-day stuff, then why do we have you here? You know, Mm -hmm. like we don't have that much space in the office. And so we need everybody to like, we've got this ship and no one is just a passenger on the ship. Everybody Mm -hmm. is a crew on the ship in some way. And, um, I think I didn't trust myself and I didn't trust my instincts that early on. And I thought there's a lot of people who are more senior than me and more experienced than me. And that was true, but that didn't mean that I didn't also have a valuable perspective to bring to the conversation. And so, so I kind of, I, I learned early on to trust my instincts and to not be afraid of sharing my opinion and my gut instinct. And that doesn't mean that like you might be told that you're wrong or that other people disagree with you, but, um, and, and that's a skill to learn too, is being okay with, um, having people disagree with you, but if you don't ever put forward an opinion, there's nothing to disagree with. Um, so that's my advice, I think, for younger people is don't be afraid to take that initiative and have confidence in your um, instincts as you're listening to people's reactions to them. And then I think like, you know, for talking to people who are in more senior positions, um, there's a lot of fear in engaging with young people around climate change. Um, you know, we 
there's like protests happen. People are afraid of engaging because there's going to be a bad moment. There's going to be a controversial. There's going to be something that gets captured on on TikTok or Instagram and it's going to go viral. And I think um, that's not helpful either in mm. the same way it helpful when we retreat into partisan camps and we don't explore where we might have commonalities, um, you know, between sort of left-wing and right-wing perspectives. It also doesn't help if we retreat into generational camps mm -hmm. and, you know, the generation um, not trusting, you know, why the older generation is taking more of a pragmatic approach to things and the older generation not trusting the younger generation that they can have like a real dialogue and conversation and not just be radical protesters. Mm -hmm. um, I see that retreat happening and that scares me a little bit. Um, and I think it takes it takes both sides to come to the table and try and avoid that from getting further entrenched. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for, for mentioning that. And I, I definitely, that's really insightful to to kind of think about the tensions from the other perspective, because right now I am that kind of young person, you know, wondering about um, mm -hmm. how to better, you know, engage with with um, older generations and that constructive dialogue that I think all of us are, if anything, that we can agree with that that is something that's on the same page. So I guess, yeah, really communicating that is, is really important. Thank you for that. Do you talk about some of your your favorite projects and memorable policies that you've advised on, and you know what your work in advising entails? Yeah. Um, so again, I kind of do some transportation stuff, and then I do climate resilience work, and uh, maybe I'll talk about uh, an example from both of those. So on the climate resilience side of things, and just to be clear about what I mean by climate resilience, we kind of think about climate mitigation and the climate resilience as um, two sides of a coin where climate mitigation is trying to um, slow or halt the underlying drivers of climate change. And then climate resilience is recognizing even if we went to zero emissions tomorrow, we're still going to be living with the impacts of climate change for decades to come. And so how do we uh, cope with those impacts and be resilient to those impacts as best as we can? In September of last year, September of 2023, we released the first ever national climate resilience framework, so a, a whole of government strategy for um, helping communities become more climate resilient. And we did a lot of um, engagement with different communities on the way towards releasing that framework. And what we heard across the board was climate mitigation. It's kind of the approaches are pretty much the same no matter where you are or who you are, because um, it doesn't matter whether you're coming from the energy sector or the transportation sector or the building sector or the industrial sector, like you are emitting greenhouse gases and the goal is to get you to stop emitting greenhouse gases. But then on the other side of that coin, when you have climate change occurring, it affects different areas very differently. Um, so you're having you know, communities across the Southwest that are primarily grappling with extreme heat and communities in Alaska that are primarily grappling with threats to um, their you know, native food supplies and kind of indigenous ways of life and the communities on the um, East Coast dealing with hurricanes and flooding. Um, and so the, the solutions to building a climate resilient nation can't really come from the top down. They have to be very community driven and locally tailored. Um, and so when we had, we released the National Climate Resilience Framework, but then we had an accompanying summit at the White House that was really focused on trying to get um, people with boots on the ground, not just like the think tank people who come to DC all the but representatives of very different communities who could share how climate change was affecting their communities specifically and what the particular challenges and solutions um, they were encountering on a day-to-day uh, -day basis. And that was really hard to do. It's, um, it's pretty easy to like find major environmental nonprofits and invite all the CEOs to the White House. It's pretty hard uh, when you're sitting in D.C. to figure out who's a leader in a community and invite them and invite them here. Um, it's just like it's literally challenging to find email addresses. So we had to do a lot of work to make sure that 
um, the people who we brought into the White House were people with direct connections to on the ground um, resilience work. And sometimes that meant that like we would invite somebody who was like a local advocate maybe they were like a branch of a nonprofit. And then we would hear from like the CEO of their DC headquarters wanting to kick them out and take their place instead. So we had to like push away a lot of kind of like big wig leadership people mm -hmm. to try directly from community members. And, um, and I think we succeeded in doing that. And that, that was hard, but, but I'm very proud of that. Um, so that was an example of, of an event in the climate resilience space. And then, uh, you know, something I've been working on since I started at the White House on the transportation side is uh, vehicle regulations for um, greenhouse gas emissions that the Environmental Protection Agency puts out. Um, and that rulemaking takes a really long time. First, you have to put out the proposed rulemaking, you take comment on it, you adjudicate the comments, you listen to a lot of stakeholder feedback, you come up with new proposals, it involves a lot of um, analysis from other agencies and expert groups, and a lot of weighing of what do we think is technologically feasible, and what do we think is the uh, um, maximum ambitious level, ambition level we could achieve. And you really do have to balance those things because if we wrote in a law, in a rule, that tomorrow all vehicles sold in the United States had to be electric vehicles, we literally wouldn't be able to do it. We just don't have enough electric vehicles right now that tomorrow you could supply electric vehicles to, to everybody who's going out there to buy a car. Um, so that's an extreme, but it does illustrate that there is a trade-off between ambition and feasibility, and you can't have to rein yourself in on ambition in recognition of what's feasible. But at the same time, um, you know, people will say it, you can you can often move faster than you think you can, um, and so what we might think is feasible uh, three years from now might turn out to be. Um, like an underestimate, for instance, um, you know, at the beginning of the Biden administration, even pretty optimistic forecasts were only projecting that we would have maybe like 6% EV sales be electric um, by this time. And um, we're, we're nearly at 10. So we're like, you know, 40% greater than that. Um, and those are, those are small numbers, um, but a, a pretty big percentage change. And we we haven't released the final rule yet, but we're getting close. And I, I'm proud of uh, my involvement in trying to triangulate between something that's really pushing us towards good climate outcomes while also recognizing practical constraints that um, automakers uh, and others face. That's really cool. I mean, just thank you for what you do in that aspect. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, you kind of touched on this while you were while you were answering that. But you now work at the federal level, you know, which has um, there is definitely some kind of disconnect that you kind of have to overcome. But you've also mm -hmm. previously, you know, yeah, you you've worked in um, the the National Resources Commission for the City of Davis. So I guess like working at those two different levels, how do they compare? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the United States has about 300 million people and the city of Davis has about 30,000. So there's quite, a, quite an order of magnitude difference. And, um, you know, again, if I go back to what you'd asked me towards the beginning of um, what drove me to pursue the career that I pursued, it really has been sort of about impact in the areas that I care about. And I think there's um, going big is is not always the same as achieving maximum impact, or, or to put it another way, you can work on a small level and also have a lot of impact. It's just what that impact looks like is different. Um, sometimes I think about when you work at the federal level, when you work at the White House and DC headquarters, you have a very big needle that you can move just a little bit. And when you work at the local level, you have a smaller needle that you can move quite a lot, but maybe the area under the under the curve or under the swoop of the needle, let's say, if that's your impact, that might actually be the same. Um, so I think it's I think it's easy um, when 
we talk about or think about working in government to think about that as always being federal or that you might start at the local level and then work your way up to the federal level. But I actually think we should be doing a lot more interchange between different levels of government because I think there are lessons that you learn at the federal level that can inform what you do at the local level. Same thing, some of my most effective White House colleagues and people with previous local experience. And at the end of the day, uh, neither of those are um, the, the best or the most impactful. They are different avenues of achieving impact. Mm, definitely. And then I guess like from my perspective, in a way, they can't really exist and function the best without each other as well. And informing totally. Each other. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think you have, you know, you've got a lot of like stuff getting pushed out by federal mm -hmm. government, but it doesn't do anything without people implementing it effectively at the local level. Yeah. No, I, I really appreciate that. Um, I mean, I guess I'm sure it was a, an ordeal to have to push out, you know, those big CEOs and, and the, the the kind of leaders and, or what we deem as leaders um, typically. But, um, you know, just it's really, I re really appreciate hearing how you can approach really engaging and those that are actually on the ground and, and you know, implementing at the federal level from that. Um, I mean, I guess like maybe this is more about just in general, like maybe what is a what is a favorite aspect of what you do and what is a not so favorite aspect? Well, working in the White House is pretty cool. I did you know, I, I have, I have a lot of appreciation for what you can achieve at the local level, um, but you do get to see some cool stuff at, at the White House. And when I um, my second week on the job um, in the Obama administration, I was working on something, and I was in um, I was in the main part of the White House and Secret Service came by and was like, just so you all know, like Leo's coming through in a little <laughs> bit. And so don't bother him. And you're we like, Leo, who's Leo? Like, because I know about like Barack and we know about Joe and we don't know about Leo. And it turned out it was Leonardo DiCaprio <laughs> who was down for a thing and he was coming and doing a White House tour. And so that was like pretty cool to just kind of see celebrities like <laughs> come on by. Um, so, so I, I do enjoy a lot of times working in government is not so star said star studded, but, um, you get a little bit of the glitz and glam being at the okay. white house. Um, and then I think like, you know, every job has frustrating components to it. And there's certainly a lot of, um, bureaucracy and, um, and red tape that you deal with from working in government. But I think what, I um, dislike more is um, when people just don't don't really want to work with you. And um, you know, we'll we'll get we'll have conversations with industry associations, and some of them will be really productive. Of you know, we also want to com combat climate change, but here's the constraints that we're facing. Maybe the way that you guys are going about doing it is imposing like high costs or hardships on our stakeholders, but we have an alternate proposal. Um, and that's really constructive. But when people come to us and they say, we hate what you're doing, full mm -hmm. stop, it's like, okay, well, I mean, we're not gonna stop trying to fix climate change, but we're happy for other ideas about how to how to do it better, how to do it differently. And so I think if you're gonna complain about something, you need to have an alternate solution. Mm -hmm. otherwise Be constructive it's, about it. Otherwise, yeah, otherwise it's just griping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for that. Um, and so I guess like, you know, you, you come from like that in working as a bridge of sorts, you know, um, with an engineering background and also just you've, you've worked with the Federation of American Scientists. Um, you wrote this, um, you co-wrote this paper or this article of sorts that I found really insightful. Um, and, you know, I guess the context of it is that we're in a, living in a time of scientific overload and there's a very worrying gap between existing research and collected data and their active application. Um, and I'll, I'll link that article that I found um, in the description because I can't do this idea justice and please correct me where I'm wrong, but um, to crudely summarize, uh, living using living evidence paradigm it's like continually updating evidence informed policy with new research as it's available rather than adapting or updating intermittently which tends to make policy outdated and less effective um, I'm curious that you know now as a policy advisor and with you know recent technology advancements um, how have you seen this paradigm being applied is it being applied more 
Um, yeah, I think that increasingly, and this is sort of a, a function of where the academic job market is going, where this it's just is um, can be harder to get a job in academia, and so that's forced people to think about other career options. Um, if you are a trained scientist, and I think that uh, you know similarly to thinking about working at the local versus federal level, you can be a scientist working in academia or outside of academia, and it doesn't mean that you have more or less impact. It just means that that impact is different. Um, but I think that with scientists increasingly pursuing a, vari a variety of career paths, that just has kind of gotten the whole scientific enterprise um, thinking about if I'm working in academia, how can I do that in an interdisciplinary way? How can I do that in an applied way? How can I do that in a way that um, helps, you know, my research really get into the world and and make a difference? Um, you know, and, and in this administration, we've done a lot of thinking about in policies related to evidence informed science evidence-informed policy making where um, we're not kind of just going with our gut or or the result of a single study, um, but really trying to be systematic in collection of evidence. And that includes, um, you know, when we say evidence, that includes traditional science, but it also includes um, cultural and indigenous knowledge. It includes oral histories. There's a lot of different evidence out there, um, but using that evidence to shape our policy. Um, and I think this is where organizations like the Federation of American Scientists and other translational organizations play a really big role because there's still, I think there's there's acknowledgement among the policymaking community that science can help. And there's acknowledgement among the science community that the their results aren't always being used as effectively as they could be, um, but there is still a bit of a gap and that's where it can fall to um, these organizations that kind of work in between to help bridge it. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and I mean, I guess this is sort of, you know, related. I, I personally hope to, you know, kind of be a part of that kind of translation-ish, um, mm -hmm. you know, because it's, it's so important. Um, and that, maybe looks like right now climate communications in some capacity yeah. um mm -hmm. but yeah and I mean I guess like just in in the climate space in general you know collaboration communication be it be, you know between spheres sectors parts of academia it, it's you know it's essential so I think you know in short we can all benefit from being better communicators um and you know as as a policy advisor you you know working as this bridge what are some communication strategies that you use um that listeners can maybe practice yeah, I think you have to think first about who your listenership is um, and who your audience is. And, and often you've got to tweak something for different audiences. So there's never going to be, um, you know, kind of one size fits all communication of like, this is the thing that um, th that everybody is going to attach themselves to. So you sometimes come up with different versions of a stump speech or different versions of a policy paper to appeal to different audiences. And then I think the um, second thing, and maybe even more important, is that um, we live in a in an attention starved world where um, it you the most important thing is to kind of get somebody's attention and explain why something matters or is relevant to them. And then once they care, you can set up time to go into more detail or, or they can, people will take initiative to find more information. But if you, um, you know, use the, the term scientific overload, I think we also have just information overload generally. So if you try and put everything out there all at once, um, you you sort of end up getting nothing. It's like when you think about when you get an email inbox and it has 10 paragraphs versus if it has two sentences, the 10 paragraphs, you won't even read two sentences of it because it's just too daunting. Mm -hmm. um, so you would think that by sending a 10 paragraph email, you get people to read more, you actually get them to read less because they're just so turned off by it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think about sometimes a 
a pyramid of communication where like at the top, you've got your bumper sticker and then maybe you've got um, your paragraph underneath that and your one pager underneath that and then kind of all of your evidence underneath that. And you want to start with your bumper sticker. Then once you've got people bought into, OK, I should pay attention, you can kind of move on to more more detail from there. I really like that visualization. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, that definitely makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, and I guess like in in general, just do you have any like um, advice for those that are working or interested in working in policy or just advisory roles in general? Like what advice or resources would you recommend for for getting started? And are there any things that they should be prepared for? Sure, um, I will, I'll try and go with three. Um, so one is, People who are, I've found people who are kind of working at the science policy nexus are pretty delighted to talk to other people who are interested in working at the science policy nexus. And um, that, that, you know, often, even if that's a cold outreach, um, people are pretty psyched to um, help mentor other people coming up in their space. Um, even so you just know that like down the line, there'll be somebody to like hand your portfolio off to. Um, so Look for people who are doing jobs that you think are interesting and don't be afraid to contact them. Um, I like it's not it's not networking where you're like, and hey, now I'd like you to offer me a job. It's just literally learning more about what they do and how they got to being where they are. Um, so there's sort of that piece of it. Um, there's the piece of taking a broad view of what working in policy is or what constitutes impact. You know, we've talked a bit about working in government at different levels. Um, but, you know, in the private sector, they have government affairs teams, or even when you think about the private sector, they're often um, shaping how the world is through their own internal policies. Think about um, Patagonia that, you know, has made some um, really remarkable commitments to sustainability initiatives for their own business operations. And those are internal policies that are shaping the flow of money and therefore shaping market impacts. And so that's policymaking in action, even if it's not public policy. And then I think, you know, finally, just what I talked about earlier on of taking initiative and being confident in instincts and but also open to different perspectives that that gets you along with people who have confidence in their own opinion and their own lived experience but are also open to considering other perspectives they're the people who are most useful to work with across the world. that's true you know no matter how old you are or how you're working Definitely. Thank you for that. Um, and I guess like this is, you know, also towards advice and just like life advice, maybe. Um, what is some of the best pieces of advice of, you know, like be, it could be personal career, just, you know, general life advice that you've ever received. And um, I mean, if, if you could also turn back time, you know, butterfly effects aside and, uh, and tell your younger self something that you wish you had known or that you've learned from life so far, what would you say? Well, my mom gave me a good piece of advice when um, I got a cruddy grade on like some of my first uh, exams in college. Um, and she said, you just you do not you don't know what other people are doing with their time and you don't know what advantages other people have had in their life. And so, you know, if you go in and you flunk an organic chemistry test, but then people around you are acing it, um, that doesn't mean that you're less capable than them, but maybe it means that like through middle and high school, they went to science camp every summer and they like had organic chemistry tutoring because they knew they wanted to go into pre-med or whatever. Um, and like, same thing about if you're in college and you see Every time you go to the library, you see that people are studying and it doesn't matter whether you go at 8 a.m. or 8 p.m. or midnight, there's always somebody studying. And so you think, my God, I should be studying every like around the clock. And, but it's different people all the time. You know, mm -hmm. some people are there at 8 a.m. and some people are there at midnight. And so you just it's it's so easy to compare yourselves to other people Um but you don't know how they're spending the rest of their time and you don't know what background they do or don't have. And so at the end of the day, you know, you should um, compare yourself to the standards that you set for yourself and, and what you 
are wanting to accomplish and feel like you can accomplish. That's really solid advice. Yeah, no, I like, I think we all have a tendency to really want to compare ourselves to kind of a, a natural thing to do, but then yeah, we're kind of comparing ourselves to what we can see on the surface level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just it's just this like really small part of it, and it's not a it's not a real comparison. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, and this is a, a question I meant to ask a little bit earlier, but um, uh, like in in terms of like your your educational background of engineering, your your passion for for science and whatnot, um, like how can you how has that been like? applying that in, in what you do? Um, well, I would say majoring in engineering nearly killed me. Um, oh, <laughs> it was mm. it was really hard. And mm -hmm. um, then I got through it. And that was another confidence boost of, you know, you can do hard things. And, and just because you struggle or you like flunk some tests, like doesn't mean that you can't figure it out eventually. Um, and I, I don't use, um, in the job that I have now, it's sort of at such a high high level of coordination that I don't use a lot of my technical skills um, or technical knowledge, I should say. But um, the same approach to problem solving and engineering and the sciences um, can apply to problem solving in other domains where you know, in, if you're doing a um, an engineering problem set or approaching a scientific experiment, you break it down into chunks and you kind of um, tackle the first piece first and then the next piece and the next piece. And um, I found taking the same approach to thorny policy issues um, stops helps helps prevent you from getting paralyzed. Where something like tackling climate change is such a huge thorny multifaceted mm -hmm. issue it's easy to be dismayed about not knowing where to start. And so then you go, okay, well, let's break it down into mitigation and resilience. And then let's break down by sector. And then let's break down in transportation. What are the different modes that we're working with? And in road vehicles, what are the different opportunities that we have? So you really just need to break down um, until you have a manageable chunk. And yes, that's only one pretty small piece of the overall problem that you're trying to solve, but it is impossible to solve that overall problem without solving the individual components. And, and you as an individual um, can also only just literally manage so many components yeah. over your life. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So I, I actually very much relate to the, like, I have family with science backgrounds that are strongly encouraging me to go into science uh -huh. and uh -huh. um yeah yeah and and but I mean I do definitely agree though and I see the value in just having you know practice in that logistical thinking process or whatnot that's really heavily involved in it so you know I appreciate that yeah yeah well and you know I did it because of family pressure <laughs> and I don't I'm not sure that I recommend that but um it did work out okay for me <laughs> at mm. the end of the day yeah um, yeah, no, I, I really want to respect your time and just thank you so much again for, for taking the time to speak with me. I, I really learned a yeah. lot. Um, yeah, uh, I guess like for, for listeners who might want to keep up with the work that you do, where can they find you? Um, I am not a huge social media person, um, but I am on LinkedIn. And so if anybody wants to uh, send me a LinkedIn message and connect, um, I am, I, I love talking to people who are um, interested in making the world a better place, especially if that's through um, progress on environmental and climate issues. And so I would just love to hear, hear directly from folks. Thank you so much. Thank you.